I'd like to turn to Matthew chapter 1. I don't intend to teach a Christmas lesson this morning, but it is a verse that's often times quoted in red around this time of year. There's a whole lot more in this verse than most people think about. Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. Here, if you're familiar, Mary was with child of the Holy Ghost, and Joseph had sought to put her away privately. I'm sure that was an interesting conversation between Mary and Joseph. Right. Mary, what happened here? Well, you'll never believe this, Joseph. And he didn't at first. So the angel came, and here were the angels speaking to Joseph. In verse 21, it says, and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Amen. I'd like to look at Jesus, what it means, what he came for, if you will. Mm -hmm. well, this, you'll find the name Jesus appears 938 times in the New Testament, mm -hmm. all the way from the very first verse here in Matthew 1, 1 to the very last verse in Revelation 22, 21. It's the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. It ends with, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. 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 So Jesus is the, the theme of the New Testament. He's really the theme of the whole Bible. But you'll find him mentioned more than any other person in the whole New Testament by far. Amen. But his name shall be Jesus, it says. Oh. This Jesus is, I guess you could call it an Anglicized or English version of the Hebrew, or really of the Greek, which is translated from the Hebrew. This Hebrew name being the same which we get Joshua from. You know, some people take issue with that we have this English version of the name of Jesus, but that is his name for us as English speaking people. Right. That's how translation and transliteration works as you, sometimes you translate, literally sometimes you transliterate it, which means you just copy it the best you can over to the new language. Right. And that's how we end up with the name Jesus. Mm -hmm. well, some people prefer Yahashua, however you say that in <coughs> Hebrew, but yeah, he lived in a time of and they spoke Greek, and so his name comes from the Greek, and we call him Jesus. Amen. This name Jesus, it means Jehovah is salvation, or it means Savior. And certainly he is the Savior. He is really the fullness of salvation. That's what it means here, that Jehovah is salvation. We like to look at what that entails. We say Jehovah is salvation. What does that mean? Well, like I said, without him, there is no salvation. Without him, salvation does not exist. We bad. We know that salvation is completely in and of God. And it's really of none other than God, Jehovah. It's not of Allah or Buddha or any of these other false gods of the world. It's only of Jehovah through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. I think we all bad. We all know Jonah 2 9, salvation is of the Lord. That means it's, it's of him, it belongs to him, if you will. It comes from him. Acts 4, we'll turn there for just a moment. Acts chapter 4, verses 10 through 12, a familiar verses for us. But Here it says, be, be it known unto you all that, and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified and God raised from the dead, even by him that this man stand here whole before you. Amen. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Notice verse 12. Neither is there salvation any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Amen. It's only through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not through Muhammad or Gandhi or any of these other philosophers of the world. 
It's not through the Roman Catholic Church or the Pope Amen. or the priest. Not even through Brother Larry over here. He, right. Well, Jehovah is salvation means that it can only come through him, through his appointed means. Amen. Okay, Hebrews 12, 2 tells us that Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. It begins and ends with him. It doesn't begin with man and end with man. It doesn't begin with God and end with man. Or, well, it starts with him and ends completely with him. It's from beginning to end, salvation is of the Lord. You know, Philippians 1, 6 tells us that he which began a good work and he will perform on the day of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Again, when what God started, he will finish. He didn't start salvation in you and then leave it up to you to keep it or finish it. Amen. It wasn't for you to start salvation and him to finish it. No. He began that good work and he will finish it. Amen. Let's turn back to Psalms chapter 3. We see that salvation belongs to God. Psalm 3, verse 8. It says, Salvation belongeth unto the Lord, unto Jehovah, thy blessing is upon thy people, Selah. Amen. So it is his to do with it as he pleases, then, if it belongs to him. It's like Brother Larry's truck is his to do as he pleases. All right. If he wants to sell it, if he wants to give it away, if he wants to run it till the engine blows up. It's his to do with what he wants to. Amen. Even more so, it, that salvation belongs to God. It is his to do with it as he pleases. He defines what it is and how it comes about. It completely belongs to him. If he gives it to who he will and when he will. Yet man cannot say, well, that belongs to me or I deserve that. Right. Well, it belongs completely to the Lord and it is his to do what he wishes with it. That's why some, some might say, well, it's not fair that he doesn't give salvation to everyone. But yet it would be fair if he gave salvation to none. Right. Amen. So it's not, it's his, like I said, to do what he wants to. It belongs completely to him. It's not, if I have hundred dollars in my wallet. It's mine. I do what I want to with it. I want to give some to Brother Larry and some to Brother Junior and none to Adam. That's my prerogative, isn't it? Right. So much more so it is with God and salvation. He can give it to whom he wills and he can withhold it from whom he wills. Right. Turn over to Psalm 68. Verses 19 and 20. Psalm 68 verses 19 and 20 say, Blessed be the Lord who daily loadeth us up with benefits, even the God of our salvation. See what? He that is our God is the God of salvation. Unto God the Lord belongeth the issues from death. Well, here we see that He is the God of salvation. That Jehovah, God, is the God of salvation. Mm -hmm. You might say, well, what's the difference between what we've already said? Saying that He is the God of salvation makes Him the ruler or controller of it. He has the power over it. That means he can, yes, he owns it, but yes, he can do with it what he pleases. He can give it out and withhold it. He can really define what it is. He can right. bring it about as he pleases, when he pleases. He is completely in control of it. Made bad. Uh, right, Apotiphar and Joseph. Joseph was in Potiphar's house. Joseph had control over all that Potiphar possessed. And Potiphar didn't even know what he had of them, but food that was before him. In that situation, Potiphar was the owner of the items. It was his to, to do with as he pleased. It was his to take away from Joseph or to tell Joseph what to do with it. Get, he'd give the power completely to Joseph to, to oversee it, to, to use it for good. But in this situation, God is both the owner and the controller of salvation. Amen. He knows exactly who has it, who he's giving it to. He knows exactly who stands.
stands in need of it and who will receive it in the future. He is completely sovereign over salvation. He's not sitting up there in heaven wringing his hands open that Amen. little John or Susie will decide to let him in one day. Hmm. Yeah. Well, he has not given his authority to anyone else. To say that he is the God of salvation means that he has complete authority over it. Amen. Well, he hasn't given his authority of salvation to the to the church even. It's our job to preach the gospel, but it's still God who does the saving. So he hasn't given his authority to the, the Pope or any other You're right. man or earthly body. You know, this, I was reading this Armenian recently, and it's opposite of what the scriptures say. This person said, the only ones that God can't say, can't help, can't change are those who won't let him. <laughs> no, God can say whom he will. He has complete authority over it. Amen. To say that God can't say those who won't let him makes man the God of salvation. He does. Let's go back to our text there in Matthew. Uh, we've seen at least a little bit what it means that Jehovah is salvation. We see that Jesus is the Savior here in the last part of verse 21 it says for he shall save his people from their sins amen and this is the reason given for the name of Jesus that he will be the savior and it says he shall save his people from their sins <clears throat> that doesn't mean that he might or maybe or make it possible but it's a surety that he will save his people amen well, Hebrews 9, 12 tells us that he obtained eternal redemption for us when he entered into the holies of holies. He didn't just make it possible, but he actually obtained it for us. It says. Amen. So, a lot of people say, well, and I understand sometimes thinking Christ did make salvation possible, but he, even more so than that, he made it a surety for his people. Mm -hmm. It says he shall save his people from their sins. What does this mean? Save it means to deliver, to rescue, to, to make whole. Christ said that he came to save sinners, didn't he? Amen. He came to save that which was lost, is what he says in Matthew 18, verse 1, or excuse me, verse 11. The Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. Amen. He came to save that which was lost, and I, he is a failure if he doesn't do so. The, You're his, right. Amen. He must save those which he came to save, or otherwise he is defeated. Amen. It says he shall save his people. That is, particular people. It wasn't just anybody, but he shall save his people. Mm -hmm. so John chapter 10, let's turn over there for a moment. He just tells us about his, who his people are. John chapter 10, verse 26. We'll go ahead and read verse 25 as well. It says, Jesus answered them, I told you, and you believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But you believe not, because you are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. My sheep hear my voice, and I know that they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Amen. The Father which gave them to me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I am a Father of one. We hear the I believe it was a Pharisee he was speaking to here, but he says that they were not of his sheep. Amen. That's why they could not hear him. That's why they could not believe. Not everyone is of, is not Christ's sheep. Not everyone belongs to Christ. Amen. In fact, John chapter 17, verse 9 says, I pray for them, I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me. Amen. They are mine. Christ was given a particular people, and that's who he came to save. 
he came to save his sheep here. He said, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Christ knows his sheep. Amen. He didn't come to save those which were not of his. He came to save his sheep. Is it going back in the beginning of the chapter here? He says that he is the good shepherd. The good shepherd. Verse 14, I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and know of mine. Mm -hmm. well, Christ knows his sheep, but he doesn't know who those that aren't his. Certainly he knows about them. Certainly he knows who they are. But... In that intimate, affectionate way, he doesn't know the sheep of the world. Mm -hmm. They're called goats in Matthew chapter 24. Christ doesn't have any goats, he only has sheep. Right. But this is his people who he came to die for. Those which were given to him of God before the foundation of the world. Those who he had a particular people in mind when he came to save his people. Now I, I suppose Christ could have died for all if that would have been the plan of God. But right. He had his people in mind. And then notice back in text it says he shall save his people from their sins. So it's not that he would save them from hell, even though that's a benefit of salvation. If you will. <coughs> Sin is the real problem. Sin is the, the root cause, you could say. Sin is what separates us from God. Sin is what has been the problem all the way back in Genesis 3 till now. So hell is not <coughs> the problem. It's just the punishment for unsaved sinners. Mm -hmm. Sin is what needed to be remedied. Sin is what needed to be taken care of. And sin is what Christ came to die for. He, Amen. He shall save his people from their sins. First Timothy 1.15, this is a faithful saying worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came in this world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Well, Christ came to save sinners. He didn't come to call the righteous for sins, did he? Amen. And that is a problem with modern theology is a lot of times it presents a savior from hell rather than a savior from sin. It presents a, Amen. a savior who just wants to help you out rather than one who will completely change you into a new creature. One who just wants you to do good works. Mm. No, Christ come to save us from sin. Yes. Amen. Good works will follow. Yes. <laughs> You'll be spared from the wrath of hell. Yes, there is much benefits to salvation. Yet if sin is not addressed, then sin is still the problem. Luke 5, 32, where he said, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Yeah. Before that, he said, the whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. Mm -hmm. Well, Christ come to make us whole once again. That's, Amen. that's part of that saving his people. Really, we were dead in trespasses and sins, and yet he came to make us alive again. So we need to be saved from sin. And if you're still lost, that's what you need to be today, saved from sin. Amen. So there's a lot of things that go along with salvation, but sin is what ultimately has to be dealt with. Well, let's look real quick and we'll close up. What does it mean to be saved from sin? So Romans chapter 6. Romans 6 verse 14 says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under the grace. Amen. To be saved from sin means it will no longer have dominion or rule over us. That doesn't mean we'll not still struggle with it. We, Paul describes that very well in the next chapter. But sin, we no longer have control over us if we're the child of God. No longer to rule our lives. He said, we, we truly are striving to serve God, yeah, we'll struggle with sin. We'll, mm -hmm. we'll see our flesh warring with the Spirit. We'll see the, them being contrary one to another. But sin shall not just rule us like it does the unsaved. Amen. Sin completely rules their lives. It controls every action they make. It 
really affects every decision they make it, from really the moment they wake up to the moment they go to sleep and even while they're asleep, sin is affecting everything they do. Mm -hmm. But it's not so for the child of God. But we can either yield our members, as verse 13 says, to unrighteousness, or we can yield them to righteousness. I guess we have a choice, you could say, how we serve God, but when we've truly been born again, sin doesn't have control over us anymore. Amen. Mm -hmm. Well, sin has been removed from our account as well. We'll turn over there in a minute, but look here in verse 18. It says, Being then made free from sin, you become the servants of righteousness. Amen. So being saved from sin that enables us to serve God the right way. If you've never been truly born again, you can't serve God. Yeah. You can go through the motions, you can do the routine, you can come to church, you can sing some songs, listen to some preaching, you can even do some quote good works, but yet you cannot rightly serve God if sin has never been taken care of. Amen. For all that are in the flesh cannot please God. Well, as long as you still have that sin that's not accounted for, that sin that's not taken care of, you cannot rightly serve God. Amen. Let's turn over to Titus for just a moment. Titus chapter 2. Verse 13 says, Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity, and purify him to himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Amen. And if you go back to verse 11 and 12, it says, For the grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared to all men teaching us that nine ungodliness and worldly lust, we shall live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Amen. Oh, how. Christ gave himself for us that we should live unto him. He said he gave himself for us that he would redeem us from iniquity, that he would buy us back from iniquity. But he literally purchased us from sin with his own blood. And he says, and purifying himself of peculiar people, a particular different type of people, mm -hmm. zealous of good works. Well, you profess to be saved and you're not desirous of good works and either you're not saved at all or you're not right with God. Right. That is the desire of the new man is to, to serve God. The desire of the, that new creature within you doesn't desire to sin, it desires to please God. Mm -hmm. I said I know we'll struggle with sin as long as we have this flesh to contend with, but yet Christ died specifically that we might be zealous of good works, that we might be free from sin, that we might be purified, as he says here. And as we mentioned in verse 11 and 12, which the grace of God teaches us how we ought to do that. Mm -hmm. Certainly, good preaching and teaching helps us to learn. Good Bible study helps us to learn. But the grace of God that's within you if you've been born again to teach Amen. you that you ought to live unto God. It says here, it teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust and to live soberly, righteously, and godly. Let's go back to Psalms. Psalms 103. This is the part we all like to hear, but yet we can't have one part without all of it when it comes to salvation. Amen. Psalms 103, verse 12, sitting be saved from sin that has been removed completely from our account. And Romans describes how that our sin was imputed unto Christ and his righteousness was imputed unto us. And our sin was really taken off of us and put on him and his righteousness was put onto us. But Psalms 103 verse 12 says, As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Amen. But infinitely apart from one another has he removed our sins from us. To never remember them no more, to never bring them up again to our account, <laughs> never charge us again for those sins. You can be sure Christ died for a particular sin. Mm -hmm. 
It's been paid for for all eternity. Amen. That's a, a problem with the whole being saved and lost again teaching that well, Christ died for sin, you can be sure it's paid for. Amen. You can't, he didn't die for sin, and oh wait, I'll take that back. Well, he says he rooted as far as the east is from the west. <laughs> you can never go east and end up going west. They are it's definitely apart from one another. And so is our sin from us if we've been born again. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I'd like to look at one more aspect of this, a couple verses here, but ultimately we'll be completely delivered from sin in all its effects. That's the will be the final fullness of salvation when we turn over to 1 Corinthians and chapter 15. I know these are familiar verses for us. It's always good to remember them. That, mm -hmm. that one day complete deliverance from sin will occur. That one day even this old flesh will not have its sinful desires anymore. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 52 through 57 says, we're going to read verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all be changed. But we, shall, we can all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Amen. This corruptible must put on incorruption, this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the same that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Mm -hmm. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of sin is the sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. When this corruptible body is changed into an incorruptible one, when this mortal body changes into an immortal one, then we'll be completely free from sin and all of its effects. Mm -hmm. Philippians chapter 3, verses 28 and 21 describe that he shall give us he shall change our vile body into a body like unto his glorious body. Uh, I don't know what we shall look like, exactly what we shall be, but First John says we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Mm -hmm. you know, I don't know if we'll all be in our prime or 33 years old or look like Christ, but I do know we'll have a body that's free from sin and all its effects. Amen. And that will be the final complete deliverance from sin. First Thessalonians 4 17 says, And then we shall be forever with the Lord. Let's turn one more place in Revelation chapter 21. Again, I'm sure verses we've all heard before, but when he's describing the new Jerusalem coming down. And he says that God shall be with his people. He shall dwell with them. In verse 4 it says, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Amen. Well, what a day that will be as we sung about. Mm -hmm. When all those things are done away with, when sin is ultimately destroyed in all its effects, that's what awakes the child of God. That's what awaits us that have been born again. Mm -hmm. It ought to be a very comforting thought that we shall be forever with the Lord and free from sin. We won't need these glasses anymore. We won't need all the medications anymore. We won't need nurses in heaven anymore, though. <laughs> I don't know exactly what we'll be doing up there other than praising God. Amen. Amen. Thanks be to God there won't be sin anymore. Mm -hmm. Well, for those that don't know Christ as Savior, they have the exact opposite awaits. Right. Instead of eternal glory, it's eternal suffering, eternal damnation. We don't have to turn there, but chapter 20 of Revelation describes that lake of fire burns the day and night forever and ever. And mm -hmm. It says the beast and the false, tor or false prophet are tormented there. And verse 15 says that whosoever was not found in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. Mm -hmm. That is the ultimate end all that don't know Christ as their Savior. They don't, they've never been born again. They've never experienced that grace of God. We'll just point you to Christ. He's the only one that can save. Amen.
For you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. There is no greater Savior than Christ. There is no more one that could save you any better, if you will, than Christ. Amen. The world has all its ideas of salvation and all it has to offer. False religions of this world have their things you must do to be saved. But Christ, he saves the uttermost and he will deliver us from sin now in new man and ultimately forever in our new body. Amen. Let's close with that thought.